How long is a turn? Moreover, how long is a combat round? And, by extension, how long does a player realistically have to decide on what action to take? Today, one-to-one -one turn tracking on Cleric Swear Ringmail. Full disclosure, this podcast has nothing to do with one-to-one -one time. That title is kind of a clickbait. But now that I've got you here, what I will say is that I'd want to talk about a form of strict timekeeping that others and I have put to use at our table, namely timing your players' actions in combat to kind of keep the game going and force them to make decisions. Now. It's not necessarily as tough as it sounds, and it's not necessarily the uh, adversarial move that you might think it is. It's something I have talked about before in the context of dungeon exploration, where you can use the time it takes your players to do something to help inform and move the clock forward. And also, it's an opportunity for me to test out this new microphone, which will hopefully get me back on the air and, more importantly, get rid of some of my sibilant S's. But now, so far it sounds like garbage, but that's okay. You guys have forgiven me for worse. So, to get to point, how long is a turn? So, basic practice. What I'm talking about doing is, in combat, when your player's turn comes up, they have a set amount of time that they can take in order to declare or complete their action. So with original Dungeons & Dragons and First Edition, one combat round is one minute abstracted. Uh, in newer editions, Third Edition on, I believe, a combat round was six seconds. And while the number varies from game to game, I find that basic expert BX, the lingua franca of the OSR, kind of gives you a good, fair feel. One combat round is 10 seconds. Now, what does this have to do with timing your players? Well, we've all had stories about combats that take too long, uh, and you kind of zone out. And part of the problem there is you have that guy who is looking up his spells while he's there. You have that guy who's playing on his phone and not paying attention. You have to tap him a few times to get him to take his turn. What you do, count to 10. You say, okay, party, your initiative. Or if you're playing individual, so-and-so, your initiative. You have 10 seconds to tell me or what you're doing. Now, in the case of spells, they should have it rip raw and ready to go. So within 10 seconds, they should be able to say, okay, this is where I cast my fireball. These are the things that will be impacted by it and here and uh, dice off, uh, save and damage. As a fighter, 10 seconds should be well enough for them to say, okay, I move up and I'm going to strike at this enemy. Roll the dice and go. That is not to say that the entire process has to complete. I'm looking at you, Sleep Spell. In BX, Sleep Spell is very easy, but in OD&D, AD&D, the Sleep Spell has multiple rolls depending on the hit die of the target, and there's different pools that you have to compare. So spells in some versions of the game are more complicated than others. However, that 10 seconds, you should be able to at least make headway. Your action should commence and ideally conclude, but it's okay so long as dice are hitting the table, so long as progress is being made. The goal is not to force the player to talk faster to get more actions in. The goal is to keep the game moving. And if that player does not respond, cannot tell you what's going on, cannot nominate a target, cannot move on the board, assuming you're using miniatures, within that 10 second window, next player. You hesitated and you can take your action next combat round. Deer in the headlights, 
Sorry, brother. Og, that sounds awfully adversarial for someone who did a couple episodes on why you shouldn't torture your players. Sounds. Sounds is the key word there. And I want to take a few minutes this morning to talk to you about why you should try this, and honestly, your players will appreciate it. It is good for you, and it is good for them, and thus it is good for the table. The first benefit, the most obvious benefit, of forcing actions to commence within a certain number of seconds is that it keeps the play moving. With the obvious exception of some more complicated higher level spells, the majority of player actions don't take very long. I move in and I stab the guy in the back. I cast my magic missile and deal X amount of damage. Uh, that, so you, when you actually know what you're going to do and do it, it doesn't take very long and the game moves forward. Now, in recent Vintage, there has been some conversation about is fast better? Quicker resolution, in my opinion, is better, but if you enjoy the tactical aspect of the game, having combats come and go may not be for your benefit. So just because something is fast doesn't mean that it's good. So what I'm talking about here is not that your combats will go from an hour down to half an hour, by no means. What I'm talking about here is that progression will continue. When a human being, that is your player, is going to be in the spotlight, and they know it, they know they have an action to take, a role to play, they're going to have it in mind. Your spellcaster, having declared their spell at the top of the round, is going to effect the spell when it gets to their turn. Your melee combatants, uh, the frontliners, are going to know where they're going to line up. They're going to probably have a plan alpha, plan bravo, formation B, get into, get into place. Your peripheral types, they're going to either be hidden already or they're going to put themselves into a position where they can backstab. Your, your group is going to do, they're going to execute. And one of the key things that a timer will do, because it forces them to think in advance or lose their effectiveness, it means they're not going to hesitate. They'll have thought it out. They'll have planned it in their head. They may have even negotiated it briefly with some of the other players to kind of, you know, make sure they're being effective. In a game with side initiative, this is a perfect opportunity to coordinate. But the biggest thing, your players, because they are playing attention and because they are planning ahead in order to keep with the cadence, hesitation goes away. So do tactics go away? No. The tactical experience and the depth of combat is still there according to whatever game you play. However, the part where the player stares at the table and wonders, okay, where am I most effective? That goes away. And as a result, your time is condensed down from the net time to just the action. Where once you had time spent in silence staring at the table, waiting for someone to go because they're trying to figure out what they want to do, when you're on a timer, that goes away. And who wouldn't agree that the after story is better when you have constant action rather than where you have those lull times? Should I stand in the west square or should I stand in the northwest square so that my flanking is more? No. You get rid of that, the combat moves forward, and you get that action story while retaining tactical depth. The next reason that you will want to try this at home is that it improves participation. I actually had to re-record that first segment about five times because I kept trying to fall into this secondary segment. That I, so I, I do have a script. <laughs> 
I tried to keep falling into this because I feel like it's just such a big impact. It helps with participation. Back in my 3.5 days, I had a group that I played with. I love these guys. I would play with them in a heartbeat again. But man, combats took forever. We actually had a particularly big one at the onset of a decent campaign where we were fighting in front of a castle wall. We started at 5 p.m. on a Friday night, and we finished at 10 a.m. on the Saturday morning. All combat that whole time. Multiple players had to leave so that they could either sleep a little bit or one of them went to work. <laughs> Hopefully he stopped in at the Starbucks on the way because I was non-functional that next day. But where I was actually going with this, people were zoning out. Uh, there was a spellcaster uh, and there was a bunch of different things on the field and he was very knowledgeable about the book and he and the DM would go back and forth about how different spells were supposed to work or how they should work based on the enemy type. Uh, there were individuals who controlled units of dudes so you had to roll multiple attacks you had to roll multiple damage dice and this probably could have been made a lot sleeker using a mass combat system we did not i don't know if one didn't exist or if we just didn't think of it but the the important part is it was a long time between turns and people zoned out uh one person would we were well, i say one person it was me and a buddy of mine building uh architecture out of our dice um there another guy was answering work emails uh, and another guy who is a social drinker now i a little bit of drinking that'll help with the social aspects of the game if you're not one who's one for talking but he was literally kind of dozing off because you know the, the buzz is over at this point and this is a self-perpetuating cycle. If the player waits a long time, I let's go back on that. The longer a player waits, that's a much better way to put this, the longer a player waits for their turn to happen, the more likely they are not to plan ahead or just to react to what's in front of them on the table instead of being prepared for the game. And that feeds hesitation that prolongs the turn and that by prolonging means the next guy is more likely to have zoned out or moved on to some other mental process so turn it all back like i described if you have that timed seconds to declare and at least begin action of your character it keeps you in the game it prevents that hesitation and by preventing that hesitation it means that you as the player have to pay attention or you're going to react poorly and so it kind of encourages participation it encourages watching what's on the table and because of the temporal consolidation it empowers player participation and so by keeping the action moving and by forcing the player to kind of be in the moment you improve participation and attention dramatically. Sound, uh, sound like any tables you've been at? Have I tempted you to try it yet? Well, got one more, just in case. The last benefit that I will ascribe to one to round round tracking, <laughs> that sounds silly. The last thing that I will ascribe to timing your player combat rounds. It helps immersion. One of the perpetual talking points for this kind of conversation is player immersion. How invested, engrossed, uh, some people will claim that you uh, become your character, and I don't buy that. I see immersion as a way to kind of improve your involvement i'll link i've already done a whole podcast on what i say immersion is i'll link to it in the show notes but either way timing your combat rounds improves your immersion for the theater kid definition of immersion where you are method acting where you're becoming your character thinking like your character it 
it makes combat much more urgent. It creates the sense of urgency because you have only a short time to act or your enemies are going to act for you uh, or act on top of you, <laughs> as it may be. Um, it also makes it feel a little more chaotic. Uh, sometimes you have to make decisions that you can't necessarily get to, um, put thought into, that is. Sorry, my uh, kids are knocking on the door. Uh, so it creates this kind of swirl of immediacy and chaos, just to use the, to reiterate the same words. It creates that kind of feel and you get into the headspace of the combat itself. Then from the secondary, uh, the CWR version of immersion, where it me it's a measure of engrossment, again, I've already kind of harped on this in a previous segment. Because you are paying attention to what's going on to tailor your action to what is going to be on your turn, and you have what you are going to do in mind, and you may pass that down the line, it builds teamwork, it improves focus, and it keeps you in the game. And you get your, your thinking about the battle at hand, you're not thinking about whether you're supposed to pick up milk on the way home. You're not thinking about whether you're being too loud in your home office on Discord. You're thinking about the game. And that is the that is the best of both worlds. Because your theater kids are getting in on the uh, chaos factor, and then your analytical minds are getting in on the player participation. And for both definitions, timing your combat rounds will help facilitate improved immersion. So, to sum up, when you are timing your turns in combat, or rounds, as is the appropriate vernacular, <laughs> When you are timing your rounds, um, while not as alliterative, it benefits the table, it benefits the ref, and it benefits the players. It keeps the action moving, keeps the action exciting, helps players keep paying attention, and it builds immersion both emotionally in the chaos of battle and mentally through planning and teamwork. Like I had mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, the inspiration for this episode came out talking to some other referees who have done this in the past. Uh, there are some folks that I've reviewed the actual place for who will, on camera, put uh, a countdown on their hands on screen. Um, for those of you who have tried this, how has it worked for you? Have there been other effects that I am failing to convey that would convert some of our wary listeners over to our camp? On the contrast, have you played in a game where the referee did this and how did it make you feel? For me, it obviously made me feel better. I felt more involved. and uh, But I respect that my perspective may not be the same as everyone else's. So call me, Anchor or SpeakPipe, probably more SpeakPipe these days. Uh, Anchor is going kind of south. Uh, comment on the video, comment on the uh, podcast. Let me know what you think. Um, I do have some call-ins from the previous episode. I recognize it's been a month or two, and I have another episode. Uh, ghouls just want to have fun, kind of in the backlog. That spawns some really interesting debate, but uh, it's just uh, having a hard time at home, having a hard time getting the editing done. I do have a new office, which actually might be the fishbowl effect that you're getting on this particular recording. Uh, so I'm hoping I'll be able to put a little more elbow grease into it, or at a minimum, I'll be able to spend some time and put these episodes out in a uh, more uh, effort-effective manner. So we are coming up on that 20-minute mark. I do have calls regarding ghouls. Uh, I would love to hear what your thoughts are, though, on timing your rounds. I will put out an episode talking about the ghoul stuff because 
I have plenty of material to go on there, and I would love to be able to put up a follow-out episode on this, either telling me I'm right, telling me I'm wrong, or, most excitingly, I would love to hear that you tried it and how it worked at your table. In any case, this has been The Whispering GM, and between now and when we talk later, delve on. wraps up this episode of the Whispering GM Podcast, a product of Cleric Square Ringmail and an independently operated production for educational and informative purposes, released under the Totally Steal This license. Some sound effects are retrieved from Pixabay, made available under the Creative Commons Zero. Others are retrieved from Mixkit.co and used under the Mixkit.co royalty-free music license. The music is Dirty Blues, composed by Michael Ramirez C., retrieved from Mixkit.co and also included under the Mixkit.co royalty-free music license. Parties interested in or with questions regarding the podcast are encouraged to reach out via the methods provided on the Clerics Wear email blog. Thank you for listening, and delve on.